Good to see everybody this morning, and uh, glad, to, glad to be here myself. I'd like to welcome our sister Jenna back, of course, Spencer and, and uh, Stephen are in the, in the young men's class back there, so uh, um, but we're, they, came, they just returned. They were in the foundations uh, in, in Memphis, Tennessee, which I received a report from Jenna that it is ex ex exceptional this year. Of course, it's always exceptional. But, and uh, as uh, Stephen put it, he's just filled up with <laughs> spiritual food. Um, so we begin, we begin this new month, July 1st. Uh, we, as we continue in, in uh, Romans chapter 14, Romans 14, we had uh, looked at verse 16 last week, closing up with that, and uh, let's see. We'll, we'll, as, in, as a uh, carrying on with the flow of what Paul is discussing, we'll review verse 16. But before we begin, let's go ahead and start with a prayer. You join me. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to Thee. You've blessed us so richly with the beautiful day. And this day we can we can uh, we have the time for ourselves to come and assemble together to worship Thee and uh, to study more of Thy Word. As we gather together, we ask Thy blessings upon us as we delve into Thy Word and that we that you uh, that we understand clearly what Thou hast for us to understand. That uh, as we consider these things, we, we meld it into everything else we've learned of thee, and that it be reflected in our daily walk. It's in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Okay, so as we, we last night I was, I was reviewing this uh, material, I was thinking, Romans 14 probably is one of the most difficult chapters to properly teach in the sense of limiting its scope to what Paul's really discussing versus what many would like to, to look at and, and expand the scope of what he is discussing. We'll, we'll look at that in a moment. But as in verse 16, as he writes, let, then, let not then your good be evil spoken of, that's in re, res, um, uh, respect of what he had just discussed regarding the eating of meats, and it, the discussion is not like it was in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, where he's discussing whether it's right or wrong to eat meats. Now he's discussing uh, the, that it's with the understanding that it's fine to eat meats, but we need to be considerate of our brethren. In this case, the Jewish brethren as, as compared to the Gentile brethren, the Jewish brethren having the, the, the law of Moses uh, in their blood, as it were. I mean, that's what they grew up with. And as they would continue in the, in the uh, many of the ordinances that were required in the Law of Moses, in that there were certain foods they would not eat because it was an unclean to them. We know from, go back to the book of Acts, where it was shown to Peter that, that all things are, are free for us to eat now for nourishment, if it's nourishing, you know. Um, that, uh, that no longer is there a prohibition to many of the foods that were prohibited under the law of Moses, such as, as uh, swine and many of the, the uh, bottom feeders in, in the ocean, um, crustaceans. And, uh, and it would seem reasonable, you consider in Colossians 1.14, where it's declared that the law of Moses was nailed to the cross. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, the law of Moses came to an end, and as a fulfillment of the prophecy that it would. You can go back to Jeremiah 31, 31, where God declares through the mouth of Jeremiah that there, there's coming a day that he would establish a new covenant with, with uh, uh, his people, not according to the old covenant. That he gets. When, it, when it was fulfilled, that it would come to an end, ushering in a new age, which we now understand to be the Christian age. Um, <clears throat> And when Jesus was discussing a couple of different things, uh, a couple of different events, I should say, that uh, as he was discussing the law of Moses, think not that I came to destroy the law, I came not to destroy the law, to, but to fulfill it. And he went on to describe, to, on the Sermon on the Mount, that's where he clarifies the false teachings or the, or the errant teachings that they had received thus far in their lives at that time, 
and he was clarifying them what the intent of the law was. And, and so, he dis so it was that they were to abide by the law. And he goes on further to say, not one jot or jittle, tittle will be uh, removed from the law till all is fulfilled. Meaning, till the whole law had been fulfilled. And of course, we knew the culmination of that came when Christ was nailed to the cross. Um, and, and so, uh, so as it is, as another passage describes it, Christ is the end of the law. It's the, it's the goal of the law, the pur purpose of the law. And, and the law was a tutor for those Jews to bring them along to Christ. And f incidentally, for the rest of the world as well. It's, I find it interesting that when uh, the wise men came from the east seeking, to, seeking the, the king that had been born, they saw his star. And so they were asking directions how to, how to find this king that had been born. How did they know about this? These were Gentiles. These were wise, they, the, the scriptures say the Magi. They were wise men, but they were also, they were more than wise men. They were counselors, and they, had, they were involved with all the, so, well, I guess you might say, scientific uh, and philosophic um, knowledge of the day. So how did they know about the, the king born? From the scriptures. So that you see the Old Testament, that scriptures that was given particularly to the Jews was available to the Gentiles as well, in which they had studied. So, um, so having fulfilled everything, the new age was ushered in. And so all the Jews should have been having the knowledge that the old law was put away and that the new law gave them liberty. The liberty that's found in Christ, they were no longer obligated to abide by the law of Moses because it had been nailed to the cross. It had died so they could be married to another, Jesus Christ. Um, but unfortunately, some, th some old habits die, die hard. Okay? And so many of the Jews held to these things. In fact, many of the Jews thought that uh, it was required of all Christians to abide by these things that found in the law of Moses. Uh, we read in, in Galatians, we discussed this last week and other times, that in Galatia, there, the Judaizing teachers were in, getting in there and teaching their, the, the, these ideas that they should be circumcised and things like that. And Paul was saying, no, 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 no. You're going back to the old law of Moses where there is no salvation. It's only condemnation. Um, and so we can see why the, the, Jew, the Jew, Jewish Christian would cling on to that law of Moses and wouldn't let go, and then expect the Gentiles to follow along. There was creating a chasm there, a schism. Not a chasm, but a schism. And, and so when, when Paul was discussing from the very beginning of the argument um, that they, sh they shouldn't uh, disregard each other, the Jews should not condemn the Gentiles for their not observing their, the, the Jewish uh, ordinances. Neither should the Gentiles make light of and uh, take for naught the Jews who were their spiritual brethren. Okay. And so Paul was trying to say we need to come together in peace, the bond of peace. peace. Um, and so when it comes to the issue of eating meats, and it's not necessarily discussing meats that were sacrificed to idols. He's discussing the meats that the Jews were uh, abstaining from because of their... Uh, sticking with the law of Moses. And it, it, Paul is making the point that this is completely a matter of, a, of options. Um, it's a matter of, it's indifferent to uh, right or wrong. Um, whereas you have Jews who, who abstain from it, or anybody who abstains from meats because of this, because of their conscience, that's their choice, and they need to understand this. Um, verse 14, I know I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. And that principle will carry through in the following passage that just because something is okay, there's no sin inherent in it, that if a person has a conscience issue with it, if he, if he does something that, he is, that goes against his conscience, this to him is sin, and that's what Paul is condemning. Now, when he says all things, this is where the difficulty comes in as far as 
we in the Western world, when we see all things, we think of the entire global scope. Okay, and that's how many people view this as all things, even those things that are sinful. Because after all, it's, it's a matter of understanding what really is sinful or not. But the, the thing is, Paul here is discussing those matters that are indifferent regarding our faith, regarding what's right and what's wrong. When I say indifferent, I mean it makes no matter, in this case, if we eat pig, if we eat pork, pork chops, or if we don't eat pork chops. It's our choice. And if somebody feels badly about eating pork chops, he better not eat it, even though it's fine to. He needs to train his conscience so he doesn't. Okay? But if he does eat it and he feels badly about it, he to himself is sinning. So all things, the scope of this is what he's discussing. Those things that are right in and of themselves. Um, um, in fact, we go to verse 13 to, to describe this very thing. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Whereas the Jews were condemning the Gentiles because they, they, they wouldn't abide by that re regulation. Uh, that Paul's saying, don't you judge those Gentiles regarding this. And neither should the Gentiles judge the Jews regarding their choice. Okay? And so, uh, as he goes in verse 15, if, but if thy brother be grieved, and if thy meat thou walkest thou not charit, uh, thou walkest not, thou, uh, thou not charitably. You're not ex expressing your love to your brother if you're, you're causing them to be grieved. Now, that being grieved doesn't mean you hurt their feelings. It means you're causing them to such, have a deep cut in their conscience that it may cause them to stumble to lose their faith or to sin themselves. So he says, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Christ died for the Jewish brethren as much as, as, much as he did for the Gentile brethren. Okay? And so we should not destroy our brethren because we want to eat meat or we don't want to eat meat. So that's what he says in verse 16. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. Don't behave yourself in such a way that whatever good you can do would be spoken badly about because of the way you treat each other, the way you have disregard for their, your, each other's uh, sensitivities, I guess one might say. Verse 17, and here's the reason. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. That's not what we're all about. These meat and drink is, is what we, it's to sustain our physical being. But the, the kingdom of God is spiritual, okay? And, and so with that, the physical should not interfere with the physical, uh, I'm sorry, the physical should not interfere with the spiritual. And so to, to bring in all these things that would cause your brother to spiritually stumble, that has nothing to do with what the kingdom of God is, that, of course, it's, it, it would be a sin. But, but what is the kingdom of God? But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, we think about walking right before God. And as I see this, his discussion, walking right before God, not only involves abstaining from sin, not only doing those things which are good, but um, righteousness within ourselves, in the sense of we're confident of what we're doing is right. That what we're doing is right and that we're not sinning. And as he said in verse... Uh, 14, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So, so with that respect, if I have a problem with eating pork, I had better not eat pork. Okay. Uh, until, and so what I do is I, I study what the word says and I come to understanding and I train myself. I train my conscience so that I understand what the will of the Lord is. Okay. Okay, in verse 18, for, for he that, is, that in these things serveth Christ is, is acceptable to God and approved of men. You know, as, as, as we consider our brothers, brethren like this with their, their best interest, and we forego or, or our rights, you know, we, we have every right to eat pork. But if I happen to know a... a a brother in Christ who also grew up in a Jewish background who has a problem with eating pork, I don't have to eat pork. In fact, I'd better not if I'm going to cause him to stumble, cause him to be grieved, to, to, uh, uh, 
take a strike at his own conscience. And in so doing, I'm acceptable to Christ and to the Father. Um, and, and it is approved of men. It's the appropriate thing to do. Let us therefore follow after the things that, which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroyeth not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. And so when he's, once again, what are these all things? He, what is the scope of what he's discussing? He's not talking about all things globally. Let me say a case in point. You know, <laughs> part of this discussion, we'll, dis we'll discuss an issue regarding uh, not giving to a little wine or Talked about the qualification of the elders. And so, well, let me find that. So I, I'm not. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. But I think there's another discussion in Titus, which uses the phrase little wine. Do what? Okay. There you go. Three. Yes, thank you. Then that's having to do with the, the, well, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. And so sometimes people look at that phrase and run with it, say, well, that says given to much wine. That means a little wine is okay. So I can drink in this case, intoxicating beverage with, uh, as long as I drink it in moderation, I'm fine, because that says not given to much wine. Well, let's, let's consider, let's, let's attach this not given to much adultery. And you take that same argument, say, so, okay, so I'm not given to a whole bunch of adultery, I don't live in it, so just a little adultery is just fine. Or, uh, yeah. Yeah. Good behavior, yeah. Less slanderous. Exactly. So I can be slanderous, but just a little. Yeah. So you see, the, the, the fallacy of that argument quickly falls away. I can be given to a little bit of sin. That's fine. I, I see your res response, Ray. Exactly. I joke around that, and sometimes I'm still telling falsehoods. Yeah. It's, it's a playing around with words, really. Uh, so it means not given to wine, period. You know, well, we go back here to Romans, and so we, when we say all things are okay, well, no, because other verses clearly declare sin is sin, and we'll, we'll be condemned. You know, know ye not that that uh, oh, the 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 list of all the 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 sins of which man will be condemned, and will, none will enter into the kingdom, never none will go into heaven. None of those things, not a little bit of any of those things. You know, so this is something where, well. All things, well, all things within the discussion. Let's, let's, let's limit the scope with what he's really discussing. That is the difference between the, the Jews and the Gentiles and their, and their comfortableness, their conscience regarding the eating of these meats which, or food which had been previously prohibited, which is now they are liberty to eat. And that's what he's talking about, things that are fine and dandy within themselves. I, I read of a story one time where there was a... a, a um, a young man who was converted and obeyed the gospel. And of course, the big teaching is, is one of the things that is discussed, that should be discussed when one is being converted, is that of the cost of discipleship and the dedication one should have, the commitment one should have to his, to his new Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that of total commitment. Nothing should interfere with his life before Christ. If something starts to interfere with his, with, uh, his Christian life, it needs to be done away. 
Well, this fellow had, happened to be a really big sports fan. His whole life was about sports. He'd watch it, he'd eat it, he'd drink it, he knew all the, all the, all the uh, stats and everything like that. And so part of his committing himself to the Lord included he needs to back off on this sports stuff. You know, sports is fine and dandy, and I'm not condemning sports at all. It's fun, and it's fine and dandy in and of itself, but this had, had in, taken con total control of him before he became a Christian, and he, so he recognized he needed to, in fact, to him, he needed to stop altogether. Well, one night, the, the guys got together and said, hey, let's go out to a ball game. Let's go watch one of the, the ball games here in, in town, and this, this new Christian is going, what? You see, to him... He had to give all that up. To him, it was an obsession, and to him, it was a sin. And so he thought, well, everybody else is in the same boat, that this, since this is my sin, that everybody else has to, under, has to abide to it. Well, upon learning this, and his response to it, they, they decided not to go to the ball game and teach him about what is really all, you know, what, what role these things play uh, in, in our activities and in our interests, our hobbies and things like that, that... There are things that are in our life that is just fine and dandy. They're indifferent to our salvation. They're indifferent to our service to God, but within a controlled region. Okay, so it doesn't. Uh, we don't become obsessed with it, and and our spiritual life suffers because of it. And after teaching it, his, con his with the knowledge is he's re be able to re uh, retrain his conscience, and later on they could all go to the ball game. But here's the thing: going to a ball game is just fine and dandy in and of itself, but because it had been such an obsession to him, it was, wrong, it was a sin for him and would have been a sin to him if they, and it would have been a sin from everybody, all the other Christian brethren, to just go without regard to this, this, this young fellow's, uh, um, young Christian's uh, con, um, regard of this activity. For, to him, it was sin. That's an, that's, a, that's an example that we usually don't consider things like that. We usually look at things like, well, here's a case where some will take this idea of, of eating meats and drinking, and drinking wine, um, and they think of, well, wine or beer, or it's, you know, if I have a little bit of it, it's fine, because all things, as they justify themselves, all things, uh, there's nothing unclean of itself, all things are, are allowable, just in moderation. And that's why I brought up the issue with, with Titus 2, verse 3, where... Uh, that, that term, a little bit of wine, is, is an invalid phrase, you know. You can't be given to a little wine just because it says not given to much wine. Okay. Any thoughts about that? Yes, Ethan. In Titus 1, 8, well, basically just verse 8, chapter 1. Uh-huh. It says, be sober-minded. Okay. Okay. Regarding wine of, of, of its, the, the topic of wine, that phrase where he says to be sober-minded, we usually think of soberness as not being intoxicated. That's how we've come to use it in, in our Western culture. But in, in this phrase that, that, that uh, Paul is using here, to be sober-minded means to be seriously minded, to be thinking things rightly, reasonably. And so when he talk, uh, we're to be sober-minded, we're supposed to be Seriously minded. Of course, that doesn't mean we're always walking around with a big frown on our face. You know, they, uh, you know, as a kid in elementary school, they started talking about the pilgrims who came to, to the Americas to, to escape the oppression that they were under in, in Europe. They wanted to, to uh, worship God in the way they saw. And, and so when they came, they were, they, we called them the Puritans, right? Well, that's how pure they were, but they, we called them the Puritans. And their, they, they were serious about their religion. In fact, our vision of it, particularly among young children, that they were so serious, life wasn't fun at all. It was just serious. Well, we're to be sober-minded, but that doesn't mean our joy is, is robbed of us. Not at all. Okay. But, but, but to be sober-minded, be serious about the coming events and where we stand before God. Now, as we think about the use of intoxicating beverage, we know that, that in the Greek language, 
the, uh, the term for wine, oinos, was a generic term for fruit of the vine, a uh, generic term that, that included not just intoxicating beverage that was, that was made for it, but also intoxicating beverage that came about through the natural process of it just too old. You know, when you, when you leave a jar of grapefruit juice out open in the, in the warm room, warm kitchen, what's going to happen before, you know, in a, in a, in a little while? It, it'll ferment. And it, yes, it will become alcoholic because that's the natural form because it's got sugars in it, natural sugars. And honestly, it's not going to taste anything like the brewed beverages that were designed, okay? But it, it gets worse. We can go back to the in John chapter 2 and the marriage feast at Cana where Jesus turned the wine and the water into wine and the, 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 the governor of the celebration came to Jesus, wow, this is great. Or went to, and he said, most everybody when they serve their wine at their parties, their, their wedding feasts, they serve the best stuff first. And when everybody's had sufficient, when they're well drunken, not drunk, but well, they've had plenty to drink, they start serving the lesser quality stuff because that's, you know, that, that's just what it is. But you saved it the best for last. And so he's complimenting the, the quality of the juice that Jesus had made, the wine that Jesus had made. Now, there are arguments to say that he made intoxicating beverage, but when we look at no, uh, I'm sort of veering off on a tangent here, but the idea was that the the best wine was the fresh wine and the worst wine was the stuff that had turned and started to go sour eventually fermenting okay um, but as we look at the, the term oinos in in the New Testament the it was a generic term for all uh, beverages from the from the grape whether it be intoxicating or just the grape juice in fact the term uh, oinos or wine is, uh, has been in the Bible is used as even the juice that's still in the grape. Okay, and obviously that's not intoxicating. That's the freshest juice that you can get from a grape. Okay, so as we think about what is it that uh, about the wine that's so so bad? Well, it's the altered state. It's the impediment to our our being able to think soberly, reasonably, because it impedes us. And like, like Ethan brought up, what level is it that he's, that he's discussing? Well, any level at which we are, our judgment is impeded, God wants us to be as sharp as we can be. You know. Now, we know also when uh, Paul gave instructions to Timothy that he should uh, partake of wine for his stomach's sake, for his often infirmities. Okay, so he would, is he talking about intoxicating wine? Perhaps. Because the alcohols in that wine would help to, to uh, kill bacteria as you would drink it. Okay. In fact, in the old, I say the old days, you know, we, we are blessed with a water system that pur purifies to a, a great extent the water that we pull out of the ground. It kills bacteria. Uh, it's in, in, and so we have fresh water daily. Just turn on the water, we, got it, we get it out of the tap. There was a time where they didn't have that convenience. They had to go to the local pool, or, the, or if they had a spring, they were lucky. But if they pulled the water out of the pool, well, what's in that pool of water? You know, well, what kind of things grow? You ever go fishing, and you have all these lily pads, and weed, the weeds growing up, and the fish, you know, what fish do in the water, <laughs> you know, just what we do, you know, not in the water. But, but uh, uh, so that the water they were getting wasn't necessarily clean. In fact, it could have... Um, bacteria in it that would cause them stomach issues. And so how would they purify that water? Well, they would take um, sometimes wine or other, uh, something that would kill the germs. Okay, so they'd blend it like that. So it's quite possible Paul was discussing with Timothy, you need to take this wine for, your med for medicinal purposes, which is in incidentally intoxicating. So there's a case where it's used for medicine. You know, lots of our medicines are made with lots of alcohol but they're not made to be imbibed, okay? They're not made to be drunk as a beverage. In fact, they purposely make them taste horribly so that, we, that people don't <laughs> ever try NyQuil. Yeah. <laughs> That's, in term, from what I've heard and read, NyQuil is what they would, the, the, the uh, brewing world would call 50 proof. 
Okay, it's 25 percent alcohol. Okay, and and I think that that a lot of these medicines are made purposely to taste horribly. They don't naturally taste horribly. They purposely make it so that people don't go to the store and, and buy that to, just to get drunk on it. Okay. Um, but as we see that we ourselves use medicines with alcohol in them for the purpose of getting well. And here is a case where Paul is instructing Timothy to, do, to, do, to uh, drink this wine in order to stay well. Okay. Now, was it intoxicating? Well, it's not clear. But whatever it was, the wine had medicinal value to it, whether it be the book. Hmm? I said, I have a question. Yes. Would Jesus intentionally make something that was being served to people where they could have a chance of getting intoxicated? That's a good question and very important to bring out in, in John chapter 2, the, the wedding at Cana. Would Jesus make something that would cause somebody to become intoxicated? We go to the old law of Moses, and it's a sin to serve somebody something that would intoxicate. It's a sin to serve somebody that, something that's intoxicated. So when people make that, that claim that Jesus made intoxicating wine, alcoholic-bearing wine, that uh, they're not realizing they're saying that Jesus sinned. The fact is Jesus did not sin. So the, the, by, by uh, logic... Jesus did not sin, therefore Jesus did not serve intoxicating beverage. Yes, Adam? First Peter 4, 3, 4, we spend enough time in our past lifetime doing the will of the Gentiles when we, all, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking, partying, and abominable idolatry. Uh-huh. Yeah. It enumerates the reveling, the, the drinking parties, uh, you know, that, that, that those, all these things. That was their former way of life. Um, and so, uh, so as we think about... This, we're, we're discussing the scope of what Paul is talking uh, is is discussing here, and it, it it we can eliminate right off the bat sin. Paul is not talking about sin. Paul is talking about those things that are are we have we are at liberty to do that is our options and are indifferent to our salvation, except in the case where we think it's wrong and we do it anyway. That's when it's not irrelevant to our salvation. That's when it become, becomes sin for us. Okay. So they were to make for peace and not destroy each other and not divide themselves over this issue about whether or not to eat these prohibited foods that were prohibited under the law of Moses and, and um, ridiculing each other when they do or condemning those or rather condemning those when they do and ridiculing those for taking that stance. Now I must insert here too. We are not at liberty to bind where the Bible has not bound. The Jews were not at liberty to bind upon the Gentiles their choice. That was their choice. That's what Paul is saying. Is it's their choice to do it. Let them do it. Okay. It's also your choice to, uh, to partake of that meat. Go ahead and do it. Okay. But don't, let, don't cause each other stumble, to stumble. So, but, so we don't have liberty to bind where the Bible hasn't bound. And neither are we at liberty to loose for the Bible have not loosed. And that comes in directly to our discussion here where Paul's discussing the difference between the Gentiles and the Jews and their, the Christians and their understanding of eating various foods. And um, he's, he's not loosing the use of sinful things. Um, verse 24, meat, destroy not the work of God. That's, don't destroy the work of God just for food. <laughs> All things indeed are pure, once again, within that realm, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. So th therein is our, the, the conscience really is important, but we must understand that a conscience is trained also. Um, There are, as I said, we cannot bind where the Bible isn't bound. Neither can we loose where the Bible isn't loosed. There are some people who have a, a perpetual conscience issue with things like um, eating in the building. Okay. Having kitchen appliances in the building. They, they look at, of course, we understand that we don't want to foolishly use the Lord's money. And we don't want to dissipate the, the Lord's money upon ourselves and our own entertainment things like that. But then there are things that are, that are the work of the Lord that, that uh, 
require for certain facilities, okay, in order to cover us. You know, we, just serving the Lord's Supper requires us to have a refrigerator. It requires us to have a sink, a way to wash utensils if we, if we, if we use them. Yeah, so we, there are certain physical things that are required just to fulfill our obligation, our command to partake of the Lord's Supper. But you also notice that the work of the Lord is also encouraging one another. As we see the brethren in Acts chapter 2 and other places where they join together in common meals, they joined in fellowship. And of course, fellowship isn't just eating together. Fellowship has more to, has more to do with we're aligned with our purpose. But part of that purpose is encouraging one another, being each other's friends, we are to, to, to have favor for each other. And how can we do that unless we spend time together? Okay. So as we think about some will bind upon the brotherhood what their own scruples are that we ought not have anything that goes beyond the fundamental fa- basics of having a big a room big enough to hold us all at one time. Um, and so here's the thing. Some people go through their life with that conscience issue regarding... Should we or should we not eat in the building? And so, because of their conscience never being cleared, they, they bind upon the rest of the brethren in that congregation. Years and years and years. That they don't use the facilities for the purpose of joining together in fellowship. And so, I think with that, the church actually suffers because they don't join together in that kind of fellowship. And so, rather than learning what the Bible says accepting it and working on the conscience, they just hold it over the brethren's head. I think this is wrong. I think we need to keep with the Bible, and we don't bind things upon the brethren that are not bound to the Bible. And of course, this goes on further than just simple things like that, um, if it's simple. You know. There are other issues regarding... Um, whom a congregation decides to support. What I mean is, uh, you know, the, the scriptures teach us that we're to visit the fathers and widows in their afflictions. So we, uh, those who have no means, ability to take care of themselves, I mean, when I say no means, you know, the widows, who, upon whom did the widows de- de- rely? Well, they relied upon their family. Well, they relied upon their husband, husbands when they were alive. Now they're dead, and their family is not there to take care of them. This is a case where the widows indeed, okay, where they have no way. And that's what, what uh, James is talking about. Or the orphans who have no way, have no, no father or mother to help them through their life. So as Christians, we are to visit. And that didn't mean just go howdy duty. This is go find out what their needs are, okay. Now, Many will take that passage and say, well, let's talk about the individual. So as we look at the examples in the scriptures, that, that the, 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 the treasury, the church treasury, when, when we come together and we contribute to it, we see the example was the, the, that, that treasury, that fund that they had gathered together was for the purpose of aiding the famished um, brethren in Jerusalem. And so they would take that money for that very particular purpose. So that's the limit of our use of the Lord's money is just for Christians and just for things like that. And there's other issues regarding the funding of the Lord's work. But as they say that, therefore, we're not obligated as a corporate body to visit the fathers and widows. That's up to the individuals. Well, there's a problem with this kind of argument. Incidentally, we, we often use the term anti, antis. Those are anti this or that. There are two particular issues. One of those is anti-orphans homes, okay, that the church body is not to use the funds, the church treasury funds, for the support of, of an orphanage. But you can do it individually. Well, you, you can start looking at this logically if an individual can do that, and he can, what about two brethren to get together and say, let's, let's contribute our funds to the, help, the aid of this orphan? You know the argument. You've heard this perhaps. Yes, Becky? Yeah, when this divided the church, uh, and how it got started was they believed that each 
and I have a cousin that has been a preacher and has taught this all these years, they believe that each individual or each family should be responsible for taking in orphans, for adopting them. Okay. Therefore, there would be no homes. Okay. There would be no need to, fit, to, send the, to spend the church's uh, money to help build the homes, you know. Okay. And the thinking were that well, nowadays, there's not that many orphans in the homes. There's children that uh, families have can't support them financially mm -hmm. or they've been abandoned. Yeah. But nowadays, there's not as many orphans, true orphans, where the parents have died as there was back years ago when this board came in. Right. So that's the basis of the way I have been taught it from my cousin being that, that this started with everyone individually or as a family should yeah. adopt at least one child. Then there okay. would not be the church's funds built on these buildings. Okay. Okay. Yes, Becky brought up an issue with today, the way our society has developed, if you can call it development, mm -hmm. rather than having orphans' homes, and orphans have a, a, a genuine need, they really do. But the way our society has, can't say progressed, can't say evolved, I guess evolved, I don't know, has, has come to a point to where we have more children today born out of wedlock than ever before. These are children without, I guess you could say, legitimate home, what we call legitimate, uh, where the father and mother are married to each other and they have children. So they, there are lots of children born under wedlock. And, um, and so they, and they're left with a mother who can't take care of them because either she's too young, not educated enough, or whatever it is, she can't take care of them. So she gives, I say she, or the, basically the parents, the biological parents give that child up for, for adoption and they usually end up in, in foster homes. I say usually. They're, 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 I don't, I'm not trying to make judgments here, but the, the issue is that rather than having true orphanages where a child's, both child's parents are dead, we have homes for the young where they have, there is no one who is taking care of them. They have genuine needs too. And so the argument is, well, the Bible tells us to visit the fatherless and the widows. So that excludes us from these, these uh, homes that uh, are, are a requirement for homes that are um, for like boys' homes or girls' homes or whatever, um, foster homes. So we don't have the obligation. I think that's a cop-out myself. The, the idea is visit those who are, are in desperate need, uh, have no means for themselves. Um, uh, at any rate, as this, as, and so that's, that's the out that, that, peop, that many will use regarding the, the support of various homes, because there are no true orphanages anymore. There really aren't. And there are other things you can do. In fact, as Becky brought, brought up, the idea is we ought to be bringing in these, these orphans into our home ourselves and taking care of them. Well, I'm looking for the, the scripture reference for that one. Well, yeah. Know, there's a lot of families that can't afford that. Right. They may have one yeah. child. They may not even can afford to support one child of their own. Mm -hmm. so Logically, you can sort of think that through. I will say this, uh, if the homes of today that are supported by the members of the church, which there are quite a few of them, unfortunately, that aren't teaching all of the truth. But if okay. They, if, if they are teaching all the truth, then just because those children are not in a private home, they're still being taught the truth in these homes. Okay. And a high percentage of them being hopefully converted Okay. Okay. Yeah, there, that's another issue which is really a tangent to what we're discussing or what I brought up is that the idea that some of these homes align themselves with, uh, I guess you could say, liberal brethren, and sometimes what they're taught isn't. Uh, it's it, they're taught uh, from a liberal perspective, and. Really, in the final analysis, they're, what they're taught, they're, the, the practices are sinful because it is, it is adding to the worship, other things like that. And a certain attitude about God, you know, uh, that, that he's daddy rather than my awesome God, okay, these kinds of things. And so because of that, we have no part in the, the unfruitful works of darkness. So that, and so when we find a home that is not teaching the truth, that, the, you know, when you think about the, 
there are homes that are sponsored by and operated by churches of Christ under the elder, uh, under the guidance under the authority of elderships. Okay, and and uh, but that's another uh, aspect of things as well. But as we look at those who are adamantly against any financial assistance from the church treasury for orphans or widows, that this is a personal thing that each individual Christian must do. Okay, so I was getting to the numbers, and I've run out of time. Let me, let me just quickly state this. The numbers game. You say, well, if one can, then if two people get together and pool their funds to support this or that work or home. Oh, if two can, then four can. If four can, then ten can. And if ten can, all of a sudden you have in a congregation, you have like, what, say, maybe 50% of that congregation is out of their own pocket supporting these funds. And then, what about 75%? Okay, then finally get 98% of that congregation supporting this work out of their own funds. Well, it's still not the corporate body, right? What if you have 100% of the congregation? Is that then, are they, is that congregation then participating in the, the, something that is supposed to be individual? It, it, what it is is a numbers game. And what it, 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 what it illustrates is that whether or not it's individual, you, when you look at the percentages, it doesn't matter because you're going to eventually work up to the entire congregation is involved with this. And is that sin? And since the entire congregation is involved with this, what is the issue regarding the use of the treasury for that purpose? If it is dedicated for that purpose and the elders have decided this is one way, one of our missions in the work of the Lord that we will do. Um, so the, I, there is, seems to be a distinction between what is done as a corporate body and what is done individually. But to say that the body of Christ cannot do what an individual can do. I think that's binding where the Lord has not bound. We see that the, the uh, entire congregation out of their church funding, out of the church treasury was aiding, out in Philippi, was aiding Paul and Thessalonica as well. They were aiding Paul in his work for spreading the gospel as a corporate body. And they were, con they were, they were cooperating in that effort. Okay. And so... Um, in, in the case where, yeah, you can individually support an evangelist or as a, as a body as well. And so as we look at, well, we do know we visit the fathers and the widows. And we do, yes, it is an individual, individual thing. But also, it, it follows that since individuals can do it, so can the body of Christ do it. Okay, take care of that. And what is, what is the point of all of this? That there are those who have bound what the Bible hasn't bound. It's one thing for an eldership to decide we're not going to do this work. And our reasoning is we don't think that we ought to. But it's another thing for that same eldership to go around the brotherhood and say, you can't do it either. They're binding upon other Christian brethren where the Bible hasn't bound. And that's, that's all I'm saying. Uh, the same with, uh, you've heard the one cuppers, those who decide to use a single cup in the, in the uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper. That's fine and dandy. That's their choice. But when they start saying that, well, you need to do that too. In fact, you must do that. Well, that's, that's, not, that's not bound in the Scriptures. So they're binding where the Bible hasn't bound. That's one side of it. And, of course, there's the, the loosing where the Bible doesn't loose. Now, I've gone over four minutes, so I'll stop here. We'll continue with the, the next. We'll finish up this chapter and go into chapter 15 next week as we... Conclude here, chapter 14, the intention of what Paul's discussing. Okay? Thank you for your comments and questions.